This is Nick Black and I'm in the Writers Guild and Magnuson has kindly come down from Silver Lake now and she's probably best known as an actress but she's also a singer, writer, performance artist. Anything else there? Mm, headache sufferer. <laughs> You were born in West Virginia. You made a trip to New York. What was the initial spark where you wanted to pursue the artistic life, shall we call it? Well, let's see. The initial spark was probably watching the Nutcracker Suite on television, you know, watching Ed Sullivan and seeing Nureyev dance or see the Smothers Brothers in their comedy hour and uh, being inspired by the shows that they would showcase on the Today Show. Television really got me out of the boondocks and it inspired me to want to perform and be part of the art world. I think my mother also was very much interested in all those things and she imparted to me a love and a desire for being around. What, what did she do? Eh? She was actually a journalist until she became a homemaker, which I don't think she liked very much. But she was actually fresh out of college and one of two people that went to Yugoslavia right after they opened it up. This is after the war? Yes. I think she was probably made for more adventure and got sequestered in the uh, American suburban dream slash nightmare. <laughs> in many ways, I feel like I'm living the life that she probably wanted to lead. Sounds very David Lynch in there. Oh, yes. There's many screenplays just waiting to be birthed out of my twisted mind. And so you're watching TV and you wanted to be a performer. What was your first step? I played the small billy goat in the billy goat's gruff in second grade. <laughs> and you got discovered. <laughs> yes, I got discovered. I also did ballet. I was always performing. My father made a little stage for me in the basement of the house I grew up in and I would put on puppet shows and these elaborate mythological plays and I'd force my brother to put a tutu on and play Hercules. And, you know, I was always the ringleader in the um, neighborhood and bossing all the other kids around, <laughs> getting them involved in all these, you know, crazy productions and carnivals and what have you and I just took that energy to New York City and ended up doing that in the Lower East Side and the East Village and downtown New York during the 80s when the um, art music scene was really really exploding and very exciting and luscious. Were you making money or did you have to have a day job? I made very little money but because my rent was so obscenely low it's hard to believe for those people who go to New York today where it's an island of the rich if you ask me. Back then in the Lower East Side you could get an apartment for $50 or $100 or 100 $50 and really eke by. We knew everybody at the clubs. We created art out of the things we'd find in the garbage and on the street and it was really, maybe I romanticize it, but to me it was a very, very exciting, wonderful time where money wasn't A, necessary and B, wasn't the goal. And today it feels to me that the art world, the art and music world, the performance world has been perverted by that. I think the world in general, but maybe it's always been that way. I just had that wonderful moment in my youth when I didn't think about money. And a lot of my artist friends start to become rich, like Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat. You kind of scratch your head and go, oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I'm supposed to be having dinner at Mr. Chow's. And you feel a little bit like the kid when the Pied Piper took all the, the kids away, except for the little crippled kid. I was like, when do I get to go? So then I think the emphasis shifted a bit, but we're still carrying the torch for art that has no commercial value whatsoever. Now, also, before I get on to your acting, you're a singer as well. Let's talk a bit about your singing for people who don't know. Can you explain what sort of stuff you sing? Yeah, well, I was in musicals as a kid. You know, we did community theater, and I've always loved music, and I was a big David Bowie fan, and I loved rock music that was very theatrically based. And when I got to New York, I ran a club called Club 57, and we would have bands. Now, we couldn't have very loud bands because it was a neighborhood, and the neighborhood complained about the noise, so we'd have to create alternative bands. And I was in a lot of those bands, and then we ended up playing in different clubs, and I had a heavy metal band called the Vulcan Death Grip. I had a folk band called Bleecker Street Incident. I had a band called Bong Water, and we put out several records. I was in a variety of lounge bands. All my acts incorporate music for the most part, music and, and spoken word, and it's just been something that I've always loved doing. I love musical comedy, but I like musical comedy with a very surrealist twist to it. And who would you say were some of your influences? Well, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Monty Python, David Bowie, Joe Bryath, who is a very obscure glam rocker that very few people know about. Oh, gee, Anne-Margaret. The Smothers Brothers, right. definitely. From one end to the other, basically. 
Yeah, yeah, and everything in between. How did you come to run a club? Well, when I went to New York, um, it was the last part of my school year, and I was working at a off-off Broadway theater, but I was spending all my nights at CBGB's and Max's Kansas City, and I got to know all these other kids who um, were fresh out of art school or still in art school. And we banded together, and we did a vaudeville show. The Polish people who ran that hall had a smaller space, which was underneath a church, Polish National Church, and we took it over, and we just wreaked havoc. <laughs> And um, had a great time. And actually, there was a book written about it called Art After Midnight. And my friend Kenny Scharf, who's an artist, he and I have written a script about our life back then called Grandma Tell Me About the 80s, which is told in flashback by the survivors of the 80s in the year 2037, who live in sort of Jetson-type homes. <laughs> the future as it was envisioned when we were kids, not the future as it is now. You've also done a lot of shows. One of the shows caught my eye, A Tribute to Muzak. Now, can you tell us a little bit about A Tribute to Muzak? Well, uh, back then I was always collecting thrift store records, and particularly those of easy listening giants like Ferrante and Teicher and Hugo Montenegro, and I got fascinated with the concept of Muzak that is played in elevators, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to set up a stage in an elevator and sing to the Muzak? So I ended up doing that at a club called Danceteria for five hours, non-stop, and we created a whole discotheque in the, in the elevator, decorated with all the album covers that I've been collecting. Did people come up and stand next to you? Or? Oh yeah, they were right in there, Art Forum wrote it up, and the, the curator of the Whitney Museum happened to be there, and he asked me to do it at the Whitney, and uh, I did it there, and it was probably one of my more conceptual pieces. And how did it go down? Oh, very well. I'd love to actually do a tour of elevators across the world. Maybe I can get somebody to sponsor that. And let's get on to your acting career. I noticed that The Hunger was your first part. How do you make the transition? Well, I was always interested in films, obviously, and wanted to act in them as well. But I was so involved in what was going on downtown. I was in a film that Beth B. and Scott B. directed called Vortex, and one of the actors in it, Jimmy Russo, told me about Once Upon a Time in America. Sergio Leone was directing Directing it, and he said, you really should get in there. And since he was a big icon, I went in and got to meet Sergio Leone, which was a big thrill. I didn't get into that film, but the casting director remembered me. So when Tony Scott was directing The Hunger, I ended up getting into that, and I got completely bitten by the bug. I remember calling my dad from London, where I was doing it. I mean, there I was working with my teen idol, David Bowie, doing this film, having the time of my life, and I said, this is what I want to do. I love it. Little did I know, 500,000 other girls were saying the same thing. And there were only five parts available, but it kind of got me going on, on that. And then I just got hooked into films. Susan Seidelman knew me from the downtown scene. I'd done a film with Sarah Driver. It was shot by Jim Jarmusch. They're married called Sleepwalk, and Susan yeah. had taken a look at that, and I got into making Mr. Wright. That was an early movie with Steve Buscemi. Was Steve in, in what? Yeah, he must have made an appearance in yeah. there, I'm sure. I haven't seen it in a long time. I can't remember. I know Nan Golden shot the stills, and I've always wanted to get some, but now I think since she's a big art star now, that's probably impossible. Because that community, everybody knew each other, and right. Susan Seidelman had seen me do things around, and she cast me in making Mr. Right. Desperately Seeking Susan? Yeah, yeah, Desperately Seeking Susan. I played the cigarette girl. I got an agent, and I decided I would check out that scene. Little did I know it would be a really tough one, but I've had some really great experiences and gotten to work with some wonderful people. Yeah, and you've got a fine resume that anyone would be impressed and proud of. It's rather eclectic, and there's some blockbusters in there with a lot of other little strange <laughs> indie things. Yes, well, that's the way I like it, like the high and the Hello. This film caught my eye. Mondo, New York. You know what? That movie enabled me to buy my first car. <laughs> well, there you go. It obviously, it was successful. Yeah, a used Mustang, 66 Mustang. I really got talked into that. I didn't want to really do it, but I beat a dead horse in that movie. That was another conceptual piece where I simply beat a dead horse, which I think says it all. It was a real dead horse? Actually, it was a taxidermy horse, and we were very insistent it had to be a real dead horse. They had to fly it in from L.A. This was in New York. No dead horses? in New York. Obviously not. <laughs> but I thought that was really the conceptual art piece, was getting these people to actually fly in this taxidermy horse. My friend William Lively, who I wrote a lot of these shows with, he passed away from AIDS several years ago, but he and I used to laugh our asses off at this ruse that we were just forcing these people to jump through hoops. You also did a film with the late River Phoenix, A Night in the Life of Jimmy Redden. Oh yes, Dear River. Actually, I play an older woman who seduces him, so we had a very intense seduction scene. Honestly, I think it's probably some of my better acting. Yeah, that really it was so tragic. River was such a, a sweet kid. In many ways, I felt... Did you sense any trouble at the time? Mm. Well, I guess one always has 20-20 hindsight. I sense that he had a lot of people around him grab 
stabbing after him, sort of metaphorically. But then everybody does, who's yeah, yeah, a, in a position yeah. of power or fame. Exactly. He did seem like the kind of kid that might have been better off taking a few years off backpacking in Kathmandu or being away from the Hollywood scene. We've seen it suck up a lot of people, chew them up and spin them out or swallow them whole. And I'm afraid River was one of those casualties. Yeah. And it's a real tragedy because he was a very sensitive, sweet, intelligent, insightful. And how was he as a Sid you see? It was very nerve-wracking because he was so young. How old was he? I think he was 16. Although Bill Richard, who wrote the script, was based on a novel he wrote at 19, and the incident actually happened, and he was 15, and the woman was 38. So when we did it, I was 30, and River was 16. At least you didn't have the authorities on your back. Oh, I don't know. There's a few moments there that are a little, well, <laughs> a little squirm. <laughs> some squirm factor is in there, but, you know, we had a laugh about it. Well, speaking of Yugoslavia, there was a film in the 70s, I can't remember the name of it, directed by Dusan Makayeva. An actress had to do, I think, a strip scene in front of underage kids, and she got in trouble with the authorities. Wow, yeah. really? Sweet movie. Oh, yes, I haven't seen that, but I love W.R. Mysteries of the Organism. Oh, okay. oh that's one of my favorite movies. You should see Sweet Movie, let me tell you. Let's talk about Tequila Sunrise with Old Mel. Did you get to chat with Old Mel? Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I was a little intimidated by him yeah. because he's a big star, but he's one of those regular guys, I suppose. Our birthdays are just one day apart, so that was yeah. some sort of false intimacy there. <laughs> but I do remember he told very goofy jokes. I had to sort of force myself to laugh at them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, puns, and he's a jokester. You've been very lucky You're with all the big sexy people. Yeah, and I've gotten to be friends with another one of your up-and-coming stars, Heath Ledger. When he came over, he got to be friends with some very good friends of mine, and actually we were all at Burning Man together in Nevada. There's another young and upcoming star who I think they're saying is going to be the new Mel. Well, I think he's going to be the new something. He's a wonderful guy and he's got a lot of talent, and he sure looks good on screen. Yeah. That's what counts. <laughs> Any seduction scenes coming up? Oh, we can only hope. I hope we can talk him into something. Only on screen, though. Of course, you're very professional. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Actually, I've got three movies at the moment. Well, I have The Caveman's Valentine with Samuel L. Jackson, mm -hmm. which I have a big love scene with him. It was his first love scene. Really? Yes, which shocked me. I actually write a column for a, a magazine out of New York called Paper Magazine. It affords me the opportunity to write about any experience I want to, and I wrote about that. But he was a real joy to work with, and that's a very unusual film. I'm looking forward to that one. Hopefully, it will be at Sundance the next January. There's a film called The Night at the Golden Eagle. Adam Rifkin wrote it and directed it, and Vinnie Jones is my pimp. I'm this crack prostitute. I actually replaced Farrah Fawcett in this film. Oh, scheduling. Those ever-elusive scheduling conflicts. But that was a great part for me to be able to play because it's very dramatic, and I don't get those opportunities that often. I'm thought very much in terms of comedy here because I was in a TV show called Anything But Love, and I played this wacko magazine editor, and unfortunately for me, because it just becomes boring, is that I get thought of as that kind of a character. I don't mind playing it, but I don't want to play it exclusively. So these two films are radically different from those kinds of characters. All that glitter. Oh, yes. Well, that's another kind of a wacko <laughs> comic character. I play this publicist of Mariah Carey's character. It's her feature film debut, and it's kind of a Star is Born scenario. It takes place in the 80s, so I get to wear this ridiculous Sheena Easton hairdo and shoulder pads. My subtext is that I'm high on cocaine the whole time. I don't know if Mariah was aware of that. Actually, I was acting all of this, mind you, but I am a real psycho in that movie. It's funny. I don't know what the end result will be. How's young Mariah as an actress? Well, you know, I think she does a pretty good job. You know what I've learned? You go in, you do your job, and you get out, and you just don't involve yourself in anything that doesn't have anything to do with you. <laughs> Learn that this is the way to survive in Hollywood. So I really have not seen anything other than what we did, and but what we did, I was impressed. I thought she pulled it off. Did you sing in any of your scenes? Oh, no, I didn't sing at all. Mariah? Oh, yes. She sings in the whole film. It's basically a musical. Well, she plays herself, but who's not herself, but she sings a lot in it. Um, I've written a new one-woman show called Rave Mom, and I'm going to be performing that in New York at PS122, workshopping it so that people can see who the real me is. So I'll be doing my live performance then, and I'm going to New York to do the vagina monologues. I'll be doing that for three weeks, but then I'm anxious to start writing my own shows again. I've got a few vagina monologues of my own that I think <laughs> will entertain a lot of people. Okay. Just before I go, I just want to talk about the monster's scary little Christmas. You played Lily, and that was shot in Australia? Yes. Yeah. That film was responsible for putting a new roof on my house. Okay. <laughs> and also for giving me the opportunity to go to Australia for the first and only time, and I hope I can go back there. I would love to go there and do one of my live performances. But I really loved it. I just thought Sydney was this 
city of the future. Uh, there's something about the quality of the sunlight, I guess because the ozone layer is so thin. And it burns. Did it burn you? Well, I lather on the SPF 45 heavily, but I went to Ayers Rock, which, you know, maneuver your way around all the tourists. I found it to be just about the most spiritual place I'd ever been, particularly the Olga's. That place had such um, an effect on me, and I would love to be able to go back sometime. What I'd really like to do is take a month off and do a whole land cruiser kind of adventure through the Northern Territory. How long were you there for? About seven weeks. And then I went up to Cape Trib and went did that whole route. Well, you've done more than me. Yeah, I know. Ironic thing, I lived in New York for at least 10 years. I mean, I live in both places. I go back and forth from L.A. and New York, but I lived there for about 10 years before I even went to the top of the Empire State Building, went to the Statue of Liberty. I don't think you go to these places when you live there. Because they're in your backyard and they're always there, so you can go any time. But when I visit a place, I go out of my way to see everything I can because I can never be assured I'll return. But I'm hoping I will return to Australia many times over. And I feel a real affinity with the Australians. And tell us about the choice that you made to the Ayers Rock. Oh yes, well, we had a long weekend during that Munsters shoot and there was a choice, staying in Sydney for the Sleaze Ball or going to Ayers Rock and the Olgas and I chose it was a hard choice, but I figured I had been to enough Sleaze Balls in my life. <laughs> but not an Australian Sleaze Ball. No, I hear they're really something, <laughs> something special but no, I made the spiritual choice <laughs> And I'm glad I did. And I actually brought back a little bag of red dirt that I have in a glass case in my house as a reminder of that magical place. A keepsake. I've been doing that. I've been collecting sand or dirt of the places I've visited. My goal is to have all five continents represented. How many have you got so far? Three. Three. Two to go. Anyway, Anne, uh, we've run out of time. Thank you very much for taking time to talk with us and coming on down. Anne Magnuson. Thank you.